Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here with Joan Alacqua, Executive Director of the History Project, um, a very august organization that was founded in 1980. And I shared with you in our online conversation that I was living in Boston then, and I knew some of the founders. Some good friends of mine were active uh, in the history project in its early days. So I'm especially pleased to have you here today to talk about it. If I may, I'd like to read a little of your bio in the second person. Um, and this is from the website. You're a professional lesbian in Boston. I like that description. Passionate about collecting and sharing queer stories to connect the generations of queer people who fought for our rights, our visibility, and our lives. Through your work collecting oral histories, preserving archival records, and sharing personal stories, your entire career has been about ensuring that communities that have been on the margins of history are centered. You connect our past to the ongoing fight for equality for all. You're the executive director of the History Project, documenting LGBTQ Boston, you earned your master's degree in public history from UMass Boston. My partner is a proud alum of UMass Boston, where she got her BA. And you got your BA in history and sculpture, an interesting combination from the University of Puget Sound. In your spare time, you designed subversive cross stitch pattern, cross stitch patterns, and read queer romance novels with your wife Sarah and your two cats, Tony and Tina. Um, our cat is Sparky, and she may make a cameo appearance in the rear. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Well, it's great to have you. Tell us about the History Project. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, living in Boston in 1980. So that's when we were founded. We, uh, a group of activists, historians, and archivists is how we tell it, came together after a presentation on uh, passing wi women in uh, Western America. And they were like, okay, so if you can find these stories about you know, people who we would now call part of the LGBTQ plus community, the language has changed and continues to change today. <clears throat> let's find it here in Massachusetts. And that's what they did. They they went into archives, they went into historical societies and museums, and they started teasing out these stories about LGBTQ plus people who have been here in Massachusetts since before the pilgrims landed. And so they took that information and they made a slideshow and they showed it at local colleges and bars. Um, and I usually say to kids these days, it's like, you know, as was the style of the time to make a slideshow, um, we still do slideshows today. But uh, over time, we began to collect records about the ongoing gay liberation movement, about the HIV and AIDS epidemic, um, about marriage equality, and we continue to do that work today. So at this point, we have over 250 collections in the archives, and those document um, through primary sources, queer life from our earliest stuff is the 1940s and 50, 50s, all the way up to, you know, current events, things that are happening right now. I have to tell you, if I may uh, be a little autobiographical, I went to one of those slideshows at somewhere, that bar, <laughs> and it, it might have been one of their first ones. It was really cool. And I also, I, I don't think the Women's Center is still in Central Square, probably, but I think I went it is still it there. is it's still it's in a new house i think but it's still it's still in that part of cambridge and one of your founders was living there when i was in both libby bouvier i remember yeah. her she won't remember me but uh it brings back a lot of memories yeah um, libby's still on our board today really like, yeah yep libby is 
Um, she really has been like a through line from the founding of the organization all the way up to, to what we're still doing now. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, at one point the collection was in the Women's Center, which, you know, posed some issues about, you know, who could access the collection and when and, you know, but, um, but yeah, I'll tell Libby you said hello. Yeah, so unless you won't remember me, I do, one my one friend was Abby Solomon, who died a little bit after I left Boston in 84. And one of her friends, who's my Facebook friend now, is Bob Skiba. And this was totally self-indulgent for me to be telling you this. But on his Facebook page, a few months ago, he posted a picture of all the founders. And I was just looking for it, but I couldn't find it. Um, and he responded, I told you I watched your interview uh, with IHP, the Invisibility, Invisi Invisibility History Project, right? And he responded. He on YouTube said I was a founder and so forth. So anyway, um, so um, how did you happen to become involved in the History Project? Are you from Boston? If not, where where are you from? And when did you move? And yeah, I grew up in Plymouth, so I am a, oh. I'm from, <laughs> I'm a, a, what do they call us? They call us mass holes, I think. It's like a Massachusetts, like, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I grew up in Plymouth, and uh, by the time I was looking at colleges, I had decided I'm going to go as far away as possible. And <laughs> so I ended up in Washington State. Um, the the sculpture and history degree, I've always been interested in history and in there, there's a, a layer of, of historical research that's, um, you know, it's about storytelling, but sometimes it's a little bit about gossip. Like there's something very enticing about that. And so that's how I started studying it. And uh, sculpture, I think I love art. I continue to do a lot of crafts. Um, thinking back on it now, I'm like, was I just trying to make my parents mad? I don't think so, but um <laughs> So I, I double majored, I graduated during our last recession, so I could not stay in Washington State. Um, so I took jobs with the National Park Service on, on a seasonal basis, ended up in California, Tennessee, and New York City, um, and New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. <laughs> and I came home essentially to go to grad school at UMass Boston. So this all, it's coming to a head, it's coming to my point, is that um, while a student at UMass I had to do an internship. And at the time you were not allowed to be paid to be an intern. And that made me mad because, you know, it's a lot of work to do internships. And my advisor said, oh, you should work for this, that, and the other, you know, kind of august, huge organizations that have been around for hundreds of years. And I said, no, I'm gonna find a place that needs me. And I <laughs> found the history project. Um, and then they couldn't get rid of me. I've been uh, involved for about 10 years now initially as an intern, then a volunteer, and then on the board. Um, and then now I'm the executive director. That's great. And you're the inaugural executive director. How did that come about? Uh, the longer story is I learned how to write grants is how that came about. But um, we've had over time um, some part-time workers, some interns, kind of folks as we've had funds to be able to bring people in for projects. Um, I came on as the first full-time staff member ever, and, and that was because we applied for a grant from the Mellon Foundation. Um, they have a program that supports community-based archives, and we were included in this first cohort. Um, and <clears throat> I had pitched the board, I think we should really hire someone to, like, to lead us. And I said, after a while, I was like, I think I should be <laughs> the person. And we, you know, we talked about it, and we worked on the grant together, and we ultimately... Um, we're funded for two years to to have an executive director. And I've now been in this role since it's, we're coming up on five years in January. So great. So it automatically renews the funding. I nope, I do a lot of other grant writing. Um, we we've continued to be pretty support supported very well by the Mellon Foundation, but we also work with the Boston Foundation, Mass Cultural Council, Mass Humanities. Um they what is it, Eastern Bank Foundation, these other um, granting agencies that have been able to support our staffing. Um, because right now we're not an endowed organization. We have a very long history, but um, every year we fundraise and spend almost our entire budget. And uh, so we're working on some sustainability planning to keep it going longer. Um, and we're really, we're starting to grow a little bit more now that we have staff. 
Well, I understand you have a physical location now in Back Bay. Is that right? So we are, we're in Copley Square. We rent office space. I know it sounds very ritzy. We are across the street from, from the, the Boston Public Library. Um, we rent space from this organization called the Community Church of Boston, who are essentially a radical, anarchist, liberal, UU church um, who have housed queer organizations for many, many years. So that's our, our office space. That's where researchers come in, um, where volunteers come in, where some of the staff works. Uh, and then we have offsite storage for other parts of the collection. Um, we had been in a space in Back Bay. We were in the same building as the Boston Living Center, um, which is an HIV and AIDS support organization. Uh, I usually wayfind people by saying we were in the alley behind Club Cafe, if you're familiar. <laughs> um, but just over COVID, it was really, it was hard to keep up with being able to pay for that space. And, and so we... We decided to, the office is a little bit smaller, but it's also, um, it means we can do more programming too, because we're not uh, as frantically trying to fundraise to make sure that we still have space to work out of. Yes, that was my question, because I used to live there when in my, but you know, I could never afford to live there now in that neighborhood, particularly. Um, so that's that's great news too, because I, I don't recall that you had an office back in 1980. Um, no, we, we've sort of had, a, yeah, since about the millennium, we've had an office. No one can give me the exact date. I think we slowly took over another organization space, but that's all hearsay. Mm -hmm. Well, I was a member of the Second Wave Collective, a feminist magazine, and we met in the basement of the Unitarian Universal Church. But the history project, and I did go to a couple of meetings, was in people's apartments, as I recall. Um, so that's great news and progress. Um, the project is an independent archives in contrast to private or university collections. What does that mean? Yeah, so um, I would say an institutional archives are uh, archives that are led or managed by, you know, archivists who work at a university or who work for maybe a historical society or a library. Often those archivists are collecting records about the community that they're part of, that university community, but also, you know, they, depending on the repository, they might be looking at, you know, the records of activists or the records of certain communities um, outside of that scope of what their community is. Um, we are an independent archives, and what that means is that we're our own 501c3, and while we partner with a lot of other history organizations and LGBTQ plus organizations, um, we're our own organization. And one of the arguments or, or one of the reasons behind that is that LGBTQ plus history has been really denied to our community for so long. You know, like, and I, I say this as somebody with a lot of privilege as a, a 30 something year old to, to access all of these stories. But even today in Massachusetts, LGBTQ plus history is not, uh, a, it's not forbidden from being part of the curricula in Massachusetts, but it's also not mandated. Um, it's still a part of history that you really have to seek out and find. And one of our concerns was, well, if we give our collection to one of the Harvards of the world, um, that'll make it harder for our community to be able to go in and, and find that history. Um, we're also, and this is something that you mentioned, Invisible Histories in the South, you know, there's a concern that if we turn all of our collections over to like a state organization and the governor changes, we have a, a, a lesbian governor right now, Governor Mara Healy, but you know, the governor changes or the president of the university changes and suddenly those records are no longer um, accessible. So it's really, it's, you know, kind of queer history in the hands of the queer community is how we see it. Um, yeah. Um. You mentioned, you mentioned in that interview that um, archives by their very nature are kind of localized, but, uh, and you also mentioned in your answer just now that you have partnerships with other archival places. Um, can you talk about the interaction between different archives? And what I'm wondering is if there's like a central archives association 
like I was just talking to a minister and discovered to my surprise, surprise, she uh, is a minister in a hospital and that there's a centralized, you know, you can go to the website and apply for ministerial jobs around the country. But uh, let's stick to our LGBTQ concerns. Is it like that? There's a central, it's, like Lesbian Hershey Archives or the one? It's, it's, yeah, exactly. And that's, there are some archives that collect nationally. Um, and some of those include lesbian history, I think, is any lesbian anywhere, anytime can be part of it. Um, there's the the Stonewall National Museum and Archives is, I believe, the official name of the one in Florida. Um, the other sort of big one is GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco, although I'm not sure if they focus solely on the Bay Area or if they, they collect more broadly. Um, but at least for, for LGBTQ plus history, I feel like a lot of what happens is happening on a local level. It's people fighting for rights at the state level or the county or town level. Um, it's people kind of working in their local communities together. And that's not to say that there are not moments of, of national action, marches on Washington and, and fights with the Supreme Court and that sort of thing. Um, but it would be really, really hard to have just one organization that tells all of those stories. And so, so that's part of it. Um, so we, we tend, our focus is on New England, um, but we tend to, the, the strength of our collections are really Eastern Massachusetts. Um, although we have, what is it, Out in the Mountains, which is a Vermont publication. We have a whole run of that, I believe. Really? Um, yeah. And it's over time, uh, we've seen a lot more interest in collecting LGBTQ plus history across New England. So now there are places like, you know, Southern, uh, Southern University of Maine has a huge LGBTQ plus collection. There's um, projects in Providence, Rhode Island, both Wanderground, the Lesbian Archives and the Providence Public Library. There was a Seacoast, New Hampshire project. Somebody was doing leather history in Vermont. So if there are <laughs> any Vermonters who wanna let me know about projects that are going on up there, I would love to know more. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're here that, you know, if there's not a place closer to home that you would like to donate your collection, we can help you. If there's, and and as archivists, we sort of as a, a profession are interested in making sure that records are places where people can find them um, and that they, they're in places that make sense. It doesn't always make sense if, you know, I don't know, if you came to Boston looking for the records of like the Lambda, uh, uh, Lambda Community Archives in San Diego, California. Like there, you know, it's it's that sort of thing. Um, as far as kind of a centralized way to find archives, there is um, a thing called Archive Grid, which a lot of, of archives put their collections into that. And so you can kind of type and say, I'm interested in this topic and it'll show you some different repositories that might have that. Um, but I think as far as LGBTQ plus archives go, um, we should have a, <laughs> a, a, a national um, like yellow pages for us or something. It's something I'll bring up. We do talk to each other a lot. Um, you know, we're all across the country um, mm -hmm. and there are community archivists who I don't know and haven't interacted with yet. But, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have peers and to, to, you know, to problem solve together and to support one another. And so we've mentioned like Southern Invisible Histories, Megan and Josh, who run that are really great. Um, the folks you mentioned, Bob Skiba, he volunteers at the, the William Way Archives, or no, the John Wilcox Jr. Archives at the William Way Community Center in Philadelphia. Uh, and it's one of those things where like, we're not in competition with one another and we try to be in partnership with one another as we can. Uh, since COVID, it's been a lot easier to, you know, hop on a Zoom event and, and share collections together. We did that just last month with the Sexual Minority Archives in Western Mass. Well, speaking of community connections, I, you know, spent the afternoon, it was wonderful, the afternoon on your website and following various, um, programs that you have. And I 
am interested in the gay community news. And I so I went to that exhibit and I found all these photographs and programming that you did. And in fact, I had watched one um, on Zoom. So um, tell us a little more about your outreach to the community. Do you move beyond the slideshows? Are you still probably not we, slideshows and bars? <laughs> well, now we do. We still do presentations. Um, and uh, I don't know the last time I used a real slide projector. Most of it is, uh, you know, we all have, have laptops now. But um, yeah, part of our mission, really, our mission has these three parts to, to document and preserve, to, to research LGBTQ plus history, to work with community members to document their stories today, um, and then to share that. And so sharing can be <laughs> through people coming to the archives to do research. We have right now, it is the fall semester, so we have about a million college students who want to come in, which is always very exciting. Um, but it's also, you know, doing programs that are accessible to people who are not historians. And um, I'm not anti-academic, but I do think that really there sometimes can be a uh, barrier mm -hmm. if, you know, you're talking about queer theory and not, you know, what communities have done or are doing. Um, and so, so we do a ton of programming. Uh, it is uh, usually free or, you know, suggested donation. Uh, and since COVID, we have recorded almost every single one of our uh, events. So now we have this YouTube channel that has a huge backlog and the events range from things like authors who talk about books and research they've done um, to community organizations talking about their own history and how they were founded and how they've moved on. We've talked with, and that's kind of across the community. We've talked with the mass bears and cubs. We've talked with the lavender country folk dancers. We've done collaborative events with uh, Speak Out, the Gay Speakers Bureau. Um, and it's part of this is, at least to me, it's it's this public historian background. You know, history, we can preserve history and we can put it in the attic and that's great. And that's, you know, it's in and safe. Um, but if no one ever uses it, why why are we saving it in the first place? So, so yeah, I would say if you check out historyproject.org, we have several events coming up. Um, and I can tell you more about those. I was going to say about GCN, we partnered with the Massachusetts Historical Society for panels about gay community news. Those are all up on our website. We have uh, digitized a lot of the GCN photo collection, not all of it, but it's a huge resource. Um, and Northeastern University has digitized almost the full run of gay community news itself. And so now... Now you don't have to come to Boston. We'd love to see you, but you don't have to come to Boston if you want to, you know, take a look at those collections. It's really exciting because I think the archives have a bad rap. People think, oh, it's musty going through old documents. How can this impact me? Yeah, we have fun stuff too, though. Like, um, that's not to say that archives at university also don't have fun materials, but, <laughs> you know, drag queen dresses and... Um, I was pulling out for students just last week, we have a whole button collection of protest buttons. Um, I pulled them out the, the ephemera from the Gays for Patsy collection. Gays for Patsy is another um, gay country line dancing organization. There's more than one down here. Uh, and it had trophies and tiny little cowboy hats and pins and patches and like all of these other things that also tell the story of these people in these communities that are all, you know, part of the wider LGBTQ plus community. Um, yeah. Well, one thing I really enjoyed in the G gay community news exhibit was the link to songs from that period. I think it was so exciting. I really, it brought me back, you know, and I think I had to link to Spotify to listen to the whole song, but I mean, that's a great feature. It's really engaging. Yeah. It's, um, that was all, I just want to give credit, that was all Marco Lanier, who was the intern who worked on that project, and Amy Hoffman, who- Really, was, Amy, then, going to yep. be a future guest. And she's been oh, excellent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we talked about her latest novel, and now we're going to talk about An Army of Lovers, her, An Army of Ex-Lovers, her GCN memoir. Um, so what are your current projects? Yeah, so we, some of our ongoing sort of things, like we're 
We're always working with folks to bring materials into the archives. Our collecting policy is pretty broad. And so we, we sometimes get folks who say, I have a box full of news clippings. Do you want that? Sometimes we do. If it's not organized, that might not be helpful. Um, but, you know, we hear from people all over the place, people who have left Boston and want to mail things to us. Sometimes people just send us stuff and we don't know where it came from, which is problematic for provenance, but I'm getting too archivey there. Um, some of the, the sort of specific collecting initiatives we have uh, right now are around oral histories for gay community news. We have oral history volunteers who have been talking to folks who were involved in the newspaper and we're trying to, I mean, it's been 50 years since the founding. So we're trying to make sure that we have these narratives, um, you know, preserved and available. And then this year is also the 20th anniversary of the first uh, same-sex marriages in Massachusetts. So we have a crowdsourced uh, community history project. And that means that anyone who has been married in the last 20 years or has a marriage story or was part of the fight or, you know, just want to tell uh, the world about part of their experience are welcome to submit it to our website and we will include it in that digital archives where the GCN photographs are. Um, and that it doesn't have to be marriages in Massachusetts because like I know that we are the first legal but Vermont predates us with the uh, civil partnerships. So if any Vermonters are interested, I, I also don't want to <laughs> try to make it seem like Massachusetts was, you know, we were the first legal, but that doesn't mean that we were the ones who set the groundwork that made it so that we could get there. That was really Vermont and Hawaii. Well, I think it's interesting that our friend Bob Skiba, who left and moved to Vermont and was able to participate in the early days of Vermont LGBTQ pride. So, you know, um, activists travel and bring their skills to every, all around, every place in the world, probably. Um, what are your aspirations for the future of the project? Yeah, so we uh, are really, we have a couple of, I was going to say sustainability projects happening right now, um, which mm -hmm. are, they're not as exciting as the drag queen dresses, but they do mean <laughs> that hopefully <laughs> we'll, we'll eventually be an endowed organization that has some funds that we can rely on year after year. So um, so we're working on that. Uh, we are also um, continuing to work on, in terms of collecting, ensuring that we are partnering with and highlighting um, parts of the LGBTQ plus community that may not have been um, already documented in the archives. And this is something that all archives and all queer archives deal with, is that the the records that we have, the most of them, the, the largest part of them are people who are part, who, who know about the organization, people who are friends with people who founded it or people who are part of organizations that are part of these networks. And so we've been trying now for the past about six years, before longer than that, but like officially for the last six years to work with particularly organizations run by people of color in Boston to ensure that we're documenting the history of the communities of people of color in Boston, but also um, so that we can uh, basically create a platform so that those organizations can share their history if they want to now. So, you know, we have some photos up from a trans resistance march a couple of years ago in the archives. We just got uh, a, a, an accrual, an addition to a collection from the Mass Trans Political Coalition. Um, we are really, you know, my entire board, my entire staff, I don't ask the volunteers, but, you know, we're all part of the community. And so it's, you know, I think dearly important to us to make sure that we are, you know, engaging with the community while we're also doing this history work. It's not, it can't be separated. Um, how can we support you? So, I mean, we're a nonprofit, so donations are always welcome. Um, but I think some of the biggest things that people can do are, you know, come to our events, sign up for our email list. Um, we tend to have a, a Massachusetts New England focus, um, which I'm sure Vermonters would love to. Um, and really spreading the word helps us a lot. It, it helps people to, to know that we are a resource for them, that we exist for them and because of them. Um, 
And right now we have uh, Matisse, who's a part-time program coordinator doing all of our social media and they are excellent. So if you wanna see some, some queer history on Instagram, follow us at, uh, at sign Boston LGBTQ history. Um, and those are really, those are all ways like just spreading the word does, does a huge, um, it, it's hugely impactful for, for community organizations, I feel. Well, we're getting toward the end of the interview. What final words, what, you, what are your valedictory remarks that you'd like to leave us with? Oh, I would like to say, I'm trying to think of my, my Vermont audience. I don't know if I mentioned on the recording. So my in-laws live in Montpelier and my sister-in-law lives, uh, she's in Burlington now, actually. She used to be in St. Albans. Oh. Um, but yeah, if there are any Vermonters who are interested in documenting LGBTQ plus history, or doing oral histories, or you know, making sure that the the stories of our community in Vermont are preserved. Feel free to reach out to us, because you know I'm not saying that you need to send things down to Boston. I don't want to be like, you know, the the <laughs> the Flatlanders storming Vermont or anything. Um, <laughs> but I'm happy to to answer questions or to to link you up with resources on how to do that yourself. If you go to if you write info at historyproject.org. I read all of those emails because we're a very small team. Um, and yeah, I would be super pleased to, to ensure that the history of Vermont's LGBTQ plus community is documented and available to Vermonters. And I think there are documentation sources here. So I like what you said about working together, you know, reaching out to different archives and having a loose, informal, um, fun connection. Yeah, yeah. My feeling, it's a gentle person's agreement, I think. <laughs> uh, as long as the history is saved somewhere, I'm happy. I'm not going to be unhappy if somebody's like, I have my stuff and I'm going to give it to Invisible Histories or Gerber Hart in Chicago, or I'm not going to give it to you guys, but I'm giving it sense. I don't, that's fine. As long as it's saved somewhere. And I feel the same way about, you know, if we can help folks um, learn how to do that for themselves or connect them to resources or anything, um, that's the whole point of, of being a community archives. We're not, we're not just hoarding the information and the records from people. <laughs> Joan Alacqua, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been great. We are in the height of the political season. And there's a new player on the field. And it may be one that is of particular interest to our communities. The Democratic Party has formed an LGBTQ plus caucus. Get your attention. So to talk with us today about the caucus, how it came into being, what we might expect from it in the future and how you can become involved is one of the people who was instrumental in it coming into being. Please welcome back Isaac Evan Franz. Welcome. Hi, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Keith. Th thank you for making time to do this because I know your schedule is very busy these days. So let's start by talking a little bit about you, your connection to Vermont, your connection to Vermont politics, because you're not a newbie on either of those fronts. It's true, I was actually born just up the street from here at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital and grew up here and came, came back here a few years ago with my husband and so, so glad to be a part of this state. Now, you've run for political office before. I have. And is that when you started to become involved with the Democratic Party, or were you already involved with the Democratic Party prior to becoming a candidate? I had campaigned for John Kerry, for Bernie Sanders, for Hillary Clinton. I'd worked on various campaigns over my lifetime. Um, actually, I, I organized Bernie Sanders' door-to-door -door campaign for Brattleboro when I was in 10th grade at Brattleboro Union High School. 
the all the adults were you know they wanted to like you know s seal envelopes and address uh address postcards and maybe they'd make phone calls but they weren't so excited about going out and knocking on doors interrupting people's suppers and my friends and I thought that would be fun you know go go around the town and knock on people's doors and be like it's like halloween except the result is that you get to support a vision for our state and country that we believe in where we have health care and education and the good stuff for everyone so that was something that we that was exhilarating to be able to do that to be able to organize my classmates to go out and we really got to know this town well i was going to say Door-to-door -door campaigning, what I remember growing up here in Vermont is that was the fundamental part of, of somebody's campaign, was not only going door-to-door, -door, but dump days when you were at the local <laughs> landfill greeting people, you know, and, and attending every community dinner that was offered. You know, ju just ask Bill Doyle about that one. <laughs> so what made you when you came back to Vermont decide to become more involved in Vermont politics because I know that, that there was a bit of a thought process before you ran for the statewide office yeah so I'm an organizer I'm an activist when I was a high school student I helped to get the gay straight actually as a middle school student helped get the gay straight alliance off the ground in Brattleboro and then we organized the first a gay straight alliance conference in Vermont here in town we did stuff with outright Vermont um so I really being gay when I started coming out when I was 13 years old and I you know I was organizing because I saw a real need for it for my safety for my classmates because it was just so clear as this social justice issue. So really a lot of my organizing grew out of my identity as being gay. And then when I was in high school, we, we, I worked with some other students to campaign for student seats on the Vermont State Board of Education. And then Governor Dean appointed me as the first student with a, the voting right there. So I had an experience being part of the government and in this appointed statewide role. And I thought, you know, this is something that um, was interesting and I learned a lot about, from it. But after I finished it, people were saying, oh, so you're going to run for office? And this is when I was a teenager and just fi was finishing you know, high school. And I thought, you know, I think there's a lot being in government, there's a lot you have to consider. Whereas when you're outside of government, you can say kind of whatever you want in a sense. And there's like there's a lot a room for the advocacy and organizing that can really influence what happens on the inside. And so that's how I spent the last 20 years is organizing specifically on federal issues. Um, done some work around healthcare in Vermont um, in terms of the research and writing that I've done. But when I, when I was moving back to Vermont, I was seeing that Senator Leahy was stepping down after half a century of service one of the longest serving senators in history. And we were about to, um, there was a, there was really not going to be much of a democratic election in terms of the primary. And I thought, wow, this is such an amazing opportunity for us to assert what are the, what is it, the, a vision? What do we want for the future? And to have, um, really have a debate, have a competition, and having a, uh, uh, an opportunity to bring in more voices into the political process, which is what Bernie always inspired me as a young person. It was all about bringing in more people to the political process, and not just the same old sort of business as usual, but, but really having some thinking about what is possible when there's our state is clearly not working for so many people. So you've talked about basically being an issue-based organizer and activist, what prompted you to then start working from within the Democratic Party? So the thing that really, really prompted me to do this was that I was seeing how the United States was engaging in endless war, spending billion, tens of billions of dollars to countries that were, were denying people human rights, 
propping up dictatorships. I mean, I was seeing what the US was doing with our taxpayer dollars. And I thought, think about what else could be used with that money in terms of schools and childcare and healthcare, things that really benefit Americans. And I saw that that was happening and I saw that there were members of Congress that were, that were not willing to use their position fully. They were not willing to use their position. Any member of the House of Representatives could stand up and introduce a resolution that would force a debate and vote on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives on U.S. participation in any number of wars that Congress has not declared. And, and so I saw this as like, gosh, if nobody else is going to do this, then I will run so that I can do that. And I can bring this issue up in the campaign and make and be able to talk about this issue of war and peace and the responsibility of our Congress to stand up for their constitutional war powers. So that's what prompted me personally to, to get involved. Of course, there were I part of my job as, as a candidate was to listen to fellow Vermonters, and I learned a lot in that process. I, now, being an openly gay candidate, did that have any impact on your campaign? Yeah, you know, there's never been an openly gay male U.S. senator in the history of this country. And so you know, I was running for U.S. Senate. If, if I had been elected, I would have become the, the first openly gay U.S. senator um, in history, the gay male senator. Um, but I, you know, in terms of impact on the campaign, I think there were some people who were excited about the, the candidacy because of being a member of the LGBTQI plus community. And then there were other people who were, um, were who were clearly, that was something that they were not excited about. And, you know, I remember being, hearing from local political leaders say, who say, saying things like, could you stop talking about being gay? Or like, why do you have to talk about it so much? And talk, hearing similar comments about Representative Ballant and, and her candidacy, you know, and it's like, and then other people telling me, oh, you should really make this a bigger thing. Like this would be this is a big deal. This would inspire a lot of people. And it's like, okay, so some people are telling me to talk about being gay more. Some people are saying, talk about being gay less. But at the end of the day, what's really important is, is for us to be able to stand up for LGBTQI plus people and, and all people, but really have a mind to, towards equity and justice. Um, I often think about the LGBTQI youth and what they're having to go through. I want to make sure that they have a real ally in, in office. So let's talk about the Vermont Democratic Party. What was it about the, the party and the party structure that made you want to become more involved with how it functioned as an organization? Yeah, well, I had seen a bit of tokenism, like seeing like, um, oh, well, we have, um, you know, we're for Black Lives or we're for LGBT people with some sort of banner at the Curtis Hoff annual fundraiser. And I thought, that's nice to have a banner, but what would be nicer is to actually have the people and to have the, um, not just the representation visually, but also having representation meaningfully and politically and having the concerns that are facing LGBT Vermonters and concerns facing um, black indigenous people of color Vermonters, having our concerns being represented and talked about when we get together as a democratic party. And so that prompted me to, to reach out to the executive committee and to talk to, um, to some of the members of the of the party, the party leaders, about what we might do to to actually meaningfully stand up for. I was particularly thinking about uh, people of color in our state and and tokenism there. But then I learned that there was an an initiative to start affinity groups or caucuses for our different constituencies, and I was asked to to start one for the LGBTQ community, and I agreed. And it's been a real joy getting to connect with our our LGBTQI plus siblings around the state who are involved with politics and want to become more involved with politics. And my hope is that we have a bit of a political home for folks where political and social home where we can support each other in organizing for the, the broad progressive democratic changes that we need in our society. Now, as I understand it, the LGBTQ 
caucus ha also has a representative now on the executive committee. Is that true of the other affinity groups? So this was something that we had uh, we had discussed and thought about. And at this point, what we have is the Vermont Democratic Party bylaws allow for us to have speaking rights at the state committee meetings. So we we can show up at the state committee meetings and we can have time on the agenda. We can we are part of that uh, the state committee. But at this point in time, the affinity groups don't have voting privileges. Correct. Okay. And other than the LGBTQ caucus, what other caucuses has the Vermont Democratic Party formed thus far? So there's an active group of people with disabilities. So a, a, a people with disabilities caucus of the Vermont Democratic Party that's been meeting um, frequently and has great, um, I've been to one of their meetings. It was a lot of great energy and they're organizing events and conversations. And um, so that's that's very active. It's a statewide group as well. Um, and I know there's been interest in starting one for BIPOC Vermonters as well, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Now, is the Democratic Party looking at this, at the caucuses forming in an organic manner where there is somebody who comes forward and says, I would be interested in forming this? Or is the Democratic Party actively reaching out to members of underrepresented, disenfranchised communities saying, would you be interested in participating? It's a bit of both, so okay. that the, the party had reached out a couple, of, in 2022, after the Democratic primary, that's when this, I received a phone call about this from the then chair of the party. Um, and that sort of prompted some of these, these conversations and it was an invitation to start this. But anybody could, could go to the Vermont Democratic Party's executive committee and propose an affinity group or a caucus. There's so a, this a is, on that. So this is a very new process for the Vermont Democratic Party. It is. But as I understand it, a caucus format is something that's been readily used in other states. Yes, that's true. In fact, about 40 other states have queer caucuses or, or equality caucuses. Um, and it's it's been amazing to connect with the Vermont uh, with the Democratic National Committee. They have a staff member specifically dedicated to support our caucuses. It's been amazing connecting with him, and he's been you know he's given us talking points, messaging that we can put out on social media. Um, fantastic, and and connected us with actually with the Massachusetts um, Equality Caucus, and we've done some phone banking with them. Um, it's been it's been really great. And we actually have members of our Vermont Democratic Party LGBT caucus th that are actively connecting on a weekly basis through the Massachusetts Equality Ca Democratic Party's Equality Caucus. So we're we're working together. We're supporting folks in New Hampshire. So it's becoming a bit of a uh, we're building a, a network that's beyond Vermont that we can um, tap into because you know the the issues that we're facing are not, are not. They may feel local and they may have a local impact, but a lot of them have national origins. You know, the housing crisis. This is not you know, this is not uh, something that Vermont invented, um, but it. And so our struggles are are connected. And beyond the, those broader issues, particular issues particular to our community as well. I mean, there's um, if you look at Project Twenty Twenty Five, which is the policy blueprint for a Trump administration. There's a, a, a plan for a return to legal discrimination against members of our community, job discrimination, other discrimination, blocking of health care and treatment for transgender people, a ban against trans people serving in the military, um, and a rollback on LGBTQI plus equality initiatives that the U.S. has supported around the world. It would re remove LGBTQI inclusive curriculum and prohibit trans students from using their preferred pronouns. Um, and it ultimately would be dismantling the Department of Education. That's it, it calls for that. So this is what we would have to look forward to under a Trump administration. And I uh, that doesn't sit well with me. I know that doesn't sit well with many people 
in Vermont and beyond. So it's great to be able to support each other, connect with our fellow caucuses to, to unite for the future that we believe in. So you mentioned phone banking, which is you know a standard tactic during election years. What other types of activities is the LGBTQ caucus looking at undertaking or what might be the priorities for the caucus? So this is a great question. Our priority has been, first of all, just to find each other. So we, this was a new idea two years ago, and it went from being a, two, a new idea two years ago to our meeting on a quarterly basis and our forming a vision for what we want to do, and then actually becoming official this past May. So we are a very new caucus. We just became officially recognized and we have prioritized social activity to really connect with each other and build from there. So this summer we had our uh, our first picnic in, in uh, Montpelier in Hubbard Park. Yep. And we've got had gatherings, the two two former, this, this, the last two springs when the the, the Vermont Democratic Party was getting together anyway. We kind of had a little huddle beforehand just to see each other and connect. Um, you know, in a lot of it is about building that social network and kind of having that affinity space so that we we know each other and we can then in our individual capacity to just show up and support one another. So when Mike Pichak was our tr state treasurer was having his fundraising or, or having a, a fundraiser, a, a campaign kickoff launch, you know, I was one of the host committee members here in Brattleboro. Like I were from the same, we went to the same middle school. We were there at the same time. We're both openly gay and it's great to be able to, su to support him. Um, you know, I know there's all of that. So to some of that, some of the work that's happening is informal. We're not trying to add a super hierarchical, big f fancy structure, but more have a space for people where we want to welcome people into the party and invite people to take action with us. So specifically to get to your question, we're supporting and electing candidates who stand up for Vermont's LGBTQI plus community. And L LGBTQI plus, just to clear that I stands for people who are intersex. Um, and we want to, we have wide open arms to all the people with all the, the alphabet letters um, that are part of our community. Um, but we're looking to build, diversify and grow political engagement for a democratic, just and democratic society that, that at all levels of government. Um, so supporting elected candidates, supporting LGBTQI plus um, Democrats, um, support and elect candidates. And then once people get into office, supporting them in office, supporting um, and advocating for policies and practices that our, com that our community needs, that uplift our community, and standing up against the tax against LGBTQI plus people, uh, promoting a sense of community. This is what I talked about in terms of the celebrations, the events, and advocating for our community within the Vermont Democratic Party to ensure that we have the accessibility, the representation, and the support that we need. Uh, finally, we want to advocate for our LGBTQI plus community and recognize and stand in solidarity with other marginalized groups. We see our liberation tied up with one another, and we're we're not going to uh, win. We're, we're, there are no oppression Olympics to win here. We're all in this boat together, and we want to make sure that we're we're uh, standing in in solidarity with fellow groups of people, people of color, um, people with disabilities women and other groups of people that have experienced depression in in building a strong party that really represents the the interests of everyday Vermonters. So this sounds like it, it would be a true opportunity for people to start becoming involved in the political process, help create a path forward that truly advocates for Vermont's LGBTQIA plus communities so how might someone reach out and become involved with the caucus? That is a great question. So the best way is to email us at lgbtqi at vtdemocrats.org. Again, it's lgbtqi at vtdemocrats.org. So, yeah. so going forward, would we envision the caucus maybe sponsoring forums during election years where we invite the openly gay candidates to come and 
tell us their platforms, tell us why they should get our votes, phone banking for them. And might the caucus be reaching out and perhaps providing testimony on bills at the legislature? All of those activities would fall within our purview and within our mission, our vision. The It's really a question of what do the members want to do and where is their energy? And we're here to support and to, to nurture that. So it's a grassroots group. We are all volunteers and we welcome people to join us with, if it's in service of Vermont's LGBTQI plus community and there's a political aspect of it, that's supportive of Democrats and the Democratic platform, we warmly welcome you. And if it's something that you're interested, you who are watching, who are listening, are interested in supporting, please email us at lgbtqi at vtdemocrats.org. Okay, <laughs> just to get it all in. So with that, thank you for spending this time with us. And I'll be looking forward to reporting on the actions of the caucus. Thank you. I look forward to that as well. And thank you for everyone who's watching and for your interest in supporting our community politically. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.